Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we welcome you to the Genii Hackathon APEC edition brought to you by Google Cloud and powered by Hack to Scale. Through this, you have a chance to revolutionize AI solutions for your region across various industries like banking and financial services, manufacturing, retail and e-commerce, media and entertainment, and innovation. And through this, you can build cutting-edge applications with tools like Vertex AI, Duet AI, Genii App Builder, and many more. So for today's uh, special leadership roundtable session that we are going to have, we have invited various industry experts to speak about the trends, challenges, and opportunities in the current AI landscape. So I'll start with the introduction of the various speakers that have joined us. So first we have with us Seema Ramachandra. She is a specialist customer engineer manager at Google Cloud. With over 18 plus years of experience in data, AI, analyt and uh, analytics to me. She has worked in the US, South Africa, Australia, and India in hands on roles ranging from data scientist, data architect, and solution architect to leadership roles in product management and business consult. Next, we have with us is Vijeta Shastri. He has a journey of over 28 years across various diverse sectors such as hospitality, retail, travel, open innovation, marketing, and many more. Uh, currently, he is the Associate Director at Standard Chartered Bank, and previously he has held pivotal roles at Dexter Capital Advisors, Thai Bank Lord, NASCOM COE, and uh, Beehive Workspace. Moving forward, we have with us Sanjeev Malhotra. He is the CEO at Center of Excellence for IoT and AI at NASCOM. So from uh, designing CPUs in Silicon Valley to uh, championing global co-innovation, he has covered a wide spectrum. He is currently building innovation ecosystem and driving co-creation of engineering solutions with larger enterprises, SMEs, and startups, which are focusing majorly on emerging technologies like AI, IoT, Meta, etc., and uh, seeing its application in the field of healthcare, manufacturing, pharma, enterprise, fintech, and many more. So next we have uh, with us Sanjay Opel. He is the founder and CEO of Finbots AI. He has an experience of over 25 years in global financial services and has served in C-level and board roles with leading global and regional uh, financial institutions across Asia, East, uh, Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Apart from that, we also have with us um, Wilson. Wilson is the driving force behind Dagangan, which endeavors to narrow the accessibility gap for over 100 million individuals in rural Indonesia. He is a seasoned, uh, seasoned digital entrepreneur, previously steered the success of Kirja, a groundbreaking platform empowering professionals through career intelligence and talent acquisition tools. Last, we have with us Edmund. Edmund is the head of strategy and transformation at uh, Boomi Resources. So um, Edmund has over 15 years of senior management experience across diverse industries, which includes banking, uh, insurance, fintech, Edmund is a visionary leader, passionate about strategy, technology, and human capital uh, development. So currently, now I'll pass on the stage to Vijeta ji, and he'll take this forward. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Shweta. I know that I'm looking slightly blurred on the screen, which I will figure out in a second. And, uh, and Sanjeev, so wonderful to see you here. Uh, just to let everyone know that I've been part of Sanjeev's team. He's a mentor to me. And uh, we still collaborate and talk to each other and see what we can do for the ecosystem. So thank you, Sanjeev, for being here. And of course, to be with this very August panel, we have Wilson here, we have Seema and Edmund. Of course, generative AI, this is the buzzword, it seems, in the last few months. There's so much happening. And I think for me as well to be here is also an opportunity to learn from all the fantastic uh, speakers here and the panelists here. And Seema, I would like to start with you because you're the person who has the most uh, hands-on and you're in the, what can I say, in the forefront, in the battlegrounds that is all happening. And we would love to get an understanding from you, right? Because we are all eager to learn from you. What is happening at with the Genai activities? What is Google up to? And how can the various entrepreneurs and founders and of course this fantastic hackathon, the uh, participants and attendees what can they learn and what can they do to leverage the opportunities that we have in the ecosystem today? Over to you, Siva. Let's kickstart with that. 
Thanks for that question, Vijeta. And you mentioned we're in the middle of a battlefield. I almost feel like I'm on stage in the middle of a magic show. That's truly how magical the impact of Gen AI has been. And uh, if I were to answer this question eight months back, the response would have been very different, right? There were a lot of our customers that we saw who were trying to experiment with Gen AI. They were running pilots, they were running POCs, and they were wondering whether this is a hype, a fad, or something that will last. And today, fast forward eight months, we completely see that narrative having undergone a change. Right, uh, because these have really come out of the workshop today to acquire production scale. Uh, Gen AI has truly come off age in the way we see our customers implement this across industries. So let me give you some concrete examples. Right, the retail customers, the e-commerce customers that we're dealing with today, um, who mostly spoke about personalization, recommendation, and all of the analytics-based use cases some time back. Today, they're looking at how can we use Gen AI to even automatically create our product catalog. I just have a bunch of images I upload, and then Gen AI can create that catalog for me and minimize the whole effort that's involved in managing a complex product catalog of millions of products. Similarly, in banking, we see how back office operations are getting humongously simplified. The documentation that's involved is very cumbersome. And Gen AI is doing a great job of summarizing some of this and giving those insights to people who are in the decision making roles. Uh, we also see things like contact centers, for example, which have ubiquitous applications across industries. So agents are being assisted in real time on what to say to really have a fruitful conversation with the customer who's calling you either to further a sale or to solve their problems, whatever the case may be. And this is being done by Gen AI applications in the background, which are really able to crawl through unimaginable huge sets of data to really come up with those nuggets that matter in the moment so that you can truly capture those customer moments that matter. So those are just some examples. And then on the creative side, we've seen how it has acquired extremely fascinating, uh, imaginative applications with our media customers uh, who are using this to even generate images, videos, et cetera. Also more ubiquitously with the marketing departments across industries who are using this to generate their ads, creatives, and campaign briefs and things like that. Um, in fact, the joke going around when we talk about this with our media customers is that in some time, it may actually take more time to watch a movie than it may take to make a movie. Um, so yeah, I think that's where Gen AI is really taking us. That's what I'm seeing from the Google standpoint with our customers. Fantastic, Seema. And we'll circle back to you. We want to understand about uh, you know, how, you are, how Google is approaching AI, what is your innovation culture. There's going to be some fantastic insights coming out from you. But now I would quickly move to Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev, you're in the industry body. You have been leading NASCOM Center of Excellence for so many years. And incredibly, the way, you know, I think four years, five years back, AI was not really talked about too much. It was IoT, hardware, data science, and now suddenly AI. And you also have a responsibility because you are also liaisoning with startups, with founders, companies, and NASCOM, Métis, etc. So keeping all that in mind, and I know that you have a very solid experience around the manufacturing side of things as well. How do you see things panning out? What are the conversations that you're having with the founders? And how are you creating the, I mean, I mean, by the way, you also have a phenomenal team who's really smart, right? I mean, they, they do so much of research and so much of events. So what is your take on Gen AI and what do you think that we should be thinking about or talking about over the next few years? Right. No, no. Thank you, Vijeta. Uh, you, you, you did, you did a great introduction and, uh, and and also what we heard from Seema just now, I think was uh, I totally agree. You know, the, some of these things look surreal now, actually. Uh, but to coming to the manufacturing, which is not on the leading edge of the adoption when it comes to the Gen AI, let me be kind of. But but when it comes to the AI use cases, it is pretty much across the board. We have seen that in last couple of years, whether it is on quality inspection or predictive maintenance. Uh, are the type of use cases uh, are absolutely, I would say, come up, come to the mainstream uh, adoption in India and across the world, I think is, is increasing at every level, I would say. Uh, the, the digital twin part is also catching up as much, you know, that's where some of the Gen AI elements will come in eventually. And to talk about particularly some of these 
where people are using the uh, some of the open ai type of applications also right similar to those is is where at more at a level which is i would say a little simplistic in a way that a lot of hr people are uh, saying that we don't want to answer so many queries so can we have uh, somebody you know answer these things for us so a lot of these large companies i know have deployed these systems to take care of internal queries uh, whether it is related with the hr or it is related with finance and so on so those things have already started happening uh, but but on the side of uh, on the on the manufacturing more deeper manufacturing um, i would say the the rate at which uh, uh, it is happening i would say is is lot on the quality inspection i think that's the place where people are seeing the maximum uh, roi on that then other area i have seen is also the supply chains where they are looking at predicting the 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 the, the changes in their organization or or in the in the um, the demand and the supply and, and and managing their supply chain using these models that's the latest one i have seen in last 3 months uh, and i'm sure more of such things are going to come in in the coming months fantastic sanjeev thank you so much for your insights and now if i may request uh, sanjay uh, you know sanjay you have been out there where you have by the you're a trailblazer you have done a lot of incredible work on credit modeling with ai at the same time there is regulation and and of course this is just the beginning i'm sure so keeping all that in mind and with your experience could you share some of the transformative impacts that generative ai applications will happen and in risk assessment fraud detection within the financial sector and of course you must be dealing a lot with the regulation that keeps coming up and changing all the time so can you throw some light on this uh, sanjay which will be really of value to all of us thank you uh thanks vijayta uh i spent considerable time in my banking career working across markets across you know different organizations different countries and you know one of the things you realize in financial services is there are a lot of core processes that are really at the heart of running any financial institution that haven't evolved much in decades and it's not for the want of effort it's just that the tools and the capabilities we had access to hugely limited that with the oncoming and you know i would say usability of ai i won't say invention of ai we've already known about ai for a long time but the ability to bring that to life is presenting us an opportunity to actually finally bring the transformation that we've not been able to put in, uh, into action for decades till now and there are multiple cases and you know whether you look at fraud detection you look at credit risk management you look at anti money laundering all these kind of areas they've traditionally suffered a lot so despite hundreds of millions and billions of dollars being poured down into these areas organizations haven't really enhanced much in their effectiveness so you know you can go google this actually which is look at what percentage of money laundering transactions actually get detected and it's a small single digit percentage right so you got millions of transactions happening what actually gets detected by the financial services system that has poured billions of dollars into it is a really minuscule proportion and the reason for that is that the ability to detect these transactions you know has always been just chasing the innovation in the criminal mind right so the guys who are actually causing these issues are always a step ahead uh, what's chasing them is very linear models and the, uh, and limited ability to process information and it's really been a victim of that uh, the same thing in credit modeling so if i go back to my first day in banking uh it took our organizations you know nearly 9 to 12 months to develop and deploy one credit model uh the time frame despite improvements and such sophistications hasn't changed much till today when you look at bringing ai into financial services i see it as a great combination where you will need both generative ai and predictive ai generative ai is playing an enormous role in you know enabling financial institutions to harness the huge amount of information they have access to in their own archives and their own systems but also externally uh, one of the biggest challenges we always had you know historically was how do we assimilate this information how do we process this information and the selection process started in such a way that finally 
the information you worked with was driven by your ability to process it and which kind of was really narrow. With the onset of, you know, an introduction of generative AI, I think that's suddenly exploding. The level of information we could traditionally use to create our insight and analytical decisioning models today is multiples of what we had just a few years ago. And I think that's what is transforming today, whole host of capabilities, business models, and practices in financial services. But that takes us to the next point, which you talked about, and which is enormously primary today, is the entire issue of regulations. There are two aspects to look at regulations. One is just the in principle regulations around some of these risk areas. But the second thing is the regulations around how AI is used. Because when you look at AI, the four key principles I think regulators across the world are united on is to look at and evaluate AI in terms of the FEAT principles, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Uh, to be honest, easier said than done, but the point is that those are really you know, core underlying foundation principles to have effective AI. Uh, you know, if you've got biased models, if you've got unfair models, you're going to be only accentuating legacy problems. If you've got lack of accountability, you know, it's a question we talked about. If a driverless car has an accident, who's to blame? Uh, if you do not have transparency in the way the models are developed and apply, you've got a challenge. So while I think we've got technology that's enabling enormous transformation in financial services, you're absolutely right. I think the regulatory aspect is becoming more and more core. We see banking regulators coming up with regulations, guidelines, et cetera, some more prescriptive, some more, I would say, guidance-led. And the entire process is evolving and you know, coming to fore. But the great thing is, I think today, the use and application of AI is pretty much on the agenda of every organization sport, every financial institutions. I, I hope you, I covered all the... Oh, the yes, you did, Sanjay. And, and, and a small aside, right? I mean, you've been a banker. There are some very smart people who are trying to you know, create amazing frauds, which doesn't get captured <laughs> immediately. So there's going to be a lot of challenges. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of work to be done by all of us. So I think that's that's something that is very important. But great insight, Sanjay. Thank you so much for that. And really appreciate your candid thoughts. And also, uh, look, you're a founder. So we have to wish you all the very best. Keep uh, making you. lots of money as well. <laughs> that should not stop. Okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, now I would like to you know get uh, Wilson uh, into the conversation. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Wilson, for joining us in from, I mean, you're, you are from Indonesia. And you do a lot of work around the rural communities. So, if, and we would, we are in India. You, as you know, we are a very, very strong agricultural economy, the world's largest population. So, we definitely need a lot of help with that. So, keeping that in mind, Wilson, uh, specifically talking about empowering rural access with AI, and what we could mean by that is improving accessibility, supply chain management. So, what is the way that you all are you're you're doing this in Indonesia and in its, in its uh, rural communities? And, you know, like, what are the process improvements you're doing? Love to understand a little bit more about that, Wilson. Over to you. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, so I, I'll just go back and explain what we do, uh, Dagang and do uh, first, I guess. So we are one of the largest distribution platform that focus on the B2B as well as B2C. Uh, on the users who are located or living in rural Indonesia. So just to give you a sense, 70% of the population in Indonesia, in total, we have 260 million uh, people. Uh, so we can imagine about 180 million actually lives in the rural areas of Indonesia. Most of them live uh, about 5 to 10 kilometers away from the wet market where they usually get their uh, stuff. Uh, their, their daily necessities. So the way we do it is basically, uh, typically before Dagangan, they will just go uh, into the market, uh, take their motorcycle up the mountain, um, you know, go out of the uh, areas that they live in uh, and, 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 and purchase the items. Uh, probably takes about half a day to pro potentially one day because they have to go through multiple different suppliers or multiple different stores to purchase their necessities. Uh, so with Dagangan, we have been able uh, to provide a platform that allows them to order 
daily necessities, mainly fast moving consumer goods, um, you know, or also like uh, basically the typical uh, dairies or daily necessities that they have. And, and we are able to get that delivered within 24 hours after they ordered. Now, the thing is that we have been focusing a lot on daily necessities, which is fast moving consumer goods. And uh, what happened is that uh, the main reason that we are not able to provide fully before or as uh, before Dagang and basically none, none of the brands, none of the distributors are able to come in and provide uh, the logistic, the supply chain capabilities is because they are so deep inside the rural that it's too expensive to serve. So what happened is that uh, most of the time, after a lot of these users goes and try to find and purchase the goods, most of them are out of stock, right? So, so we have been able to provide that demand uh, or at least cover the supply needed uh, to ensure uh, that basically they are able to get their daily necessities on time uh, with a proper pricing. Now, of course, as a distributors ourselves, or basically as a platform ourselves, uh, if we keep doing whatever the offline guys has been doing, uh, the cost will be way up to the roof, right? So what we do is then we have to use multiple different technologies out there that allow us to be able to make sure our cost is on track, uh, make sure that we remain uh, even though we are a startup, uh, we remain profitable in a way, right? And then by doing that, that means we have to go deeper into our operation, such as our demand forecasting, our route optimization, our inventory management, our cash management, uh, and so on, to make sure that basically we have we are able uh, to provide uh, the the necessary uh, supplies at the correct pricing at the correct uh, forecasted. Uh, products so that we don't have an oversupply of goods in our warehouse, right? So, so that's some, something that we have been doing for the last four years. And uh, the thing is, basically, a lot of people might not realize uh, that um, the deeper you go into the rural, the more of this uh, demand forecasting, a lot of optimization, a lot of this um, uh, needs that we need, we, we need to make sure our cost remains low uh, is necessary. And you know, Indonesia has in total 17,000 islands. And once you go and talk about basically uh, water shipping, uh, when the, you have to transport between an island to another island, the cost skies up to uh, shoot up to the roof, right? So, so these are something uh, that we have been applying uh, to make sure that we understand uh, what do we need to do to make sure our uh, we have a, a proper uh, and optimized routing. That's actually on the supply side. Of course, on the demand side, then uh, we are talking about like local language. Um, you know, Indonesia has in total about 900 languages. Um, a lot of them, if let's say, are, uh, if, 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 if the language are not something that they are not used to, they will not want to purchase from you, right? There's a lot of community engagement that we are actually doing to make sure that there is a decision-making process that, that, that allow them to you no, know, uh, at least they, they they feel safe purchasing from a platform when before they have to go to the wet market uh, offline uh, to do it. Uh, so so it's something that we have been uh, focusing a lot uh, to make sure that we uh, have uh, acquired uh, the right customers out there. Plus, on top of that, uh, you know, because of the supply chain issues that has been in Indonesia for a long time, uh, 17,000 island in total, uh, you can imagine uh, pricing in one island as compared to another island. Uh, the price can differ by a lot. You know, sometimes it goes up to double uh, in terms of the pricing itself. So dynamic pricing is kind of necessary uh, to make sure that we know uh, what's the right uh, price that we need to sell on each of these goods. So, so we 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 are using a lot of these technologies. We 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 definitely uh, are going to embrace this a lot more. Um, you know, technically speaking, four years ago, we are an offline distribution company. Now, uh, basically, I don't think we can call ourselves an offline distribution company anymore uh, just because of the amount of effort that we put in uh, at the back uh, to make sure that uh, we keep our cost low uh, and basically with a proper pricing. You know, FMCG is a tough 
is one of the toughest business out there because of the small margin that you are doing. So we have to make sure uh, that we actually uh, properly charge our customers in different places. These are something that we have been using uh, and, and hopefully uh, we will co keep continuing to, to embrace this technology along the way. Amazing, Vincent. I think what we one thing that resonates is you said 900 languages. I'm not too sure. I think we have what, maybe 100 plus languages and dialects. So we totally empathize and understand what you go through. And yes, the islands, I've only been to Bali. It's a beautiful place. You people are wonderful. And thank you for sharing all these insights, Wilson. And we empathize and wish you all the best also, because we face a lot of challenges out here in India as well. So thank you for that. And now I would love to come to Edmund. Uh, Edmund, your designation says strategy and transformation. So we have to first get from you the input around what exactly does that entail in the AI world? And number one, and number two, Wilson spoke about colloquial, uh, colloquialism, right? Where I think we can also learn from you because you do a lot of, you're going to be doing a lot of work around that because Indonesia is so diverse. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Because again, we will be learning from you. Over to you, Edmund. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think, I think there's much to learn from AI. <laughs> and that's what it is. We have to give it to uh, technology. Uh, one of the things that I see uh, lately, most people are getting anxious, right? Uh, because uh, with job displacement, with the uh, rise of uh, automation everywhere, people are anxious, what can leaders do? What can uh, we as uh, owners of companies are able to maximize return, right? So uh, my role has always been uh, within companies to be consultant. And I've all, also, on, I've consulted many different financial services industries. I've consulted, uh, what do you call this, uh, logistics companies. I've consulted mining companies. Uh, I've worked with many different various vendors to create solutions to enable uh, maximize a return, right? Of course, that's that's the whole idea of having a company, right? But again, at the end of the day, um, yeah, what does my job entail? Creating strategy. Strategy for what? Most of the time people think, hey, you know what? Having AI is so expensive, you know? <laughs> and that's what everybody thought, right? Ah, we can't afford having AI. We can't do this and that. That's too much for us to do. There's a lot of work needs to be done. We need to hire a lot of people. We need to. So I've been doing consultancies for a long time. And I've been in the AI business for quite a long time. Uh, so you've seen I've, uh, in my LinkedIn, I, I, I spoke in many different uh, uh, conferences everywhere around the world. I was recently went to Dubai and um, uh, what do you call this, uh, Eastern Europe. And this is, even in those levels, uh, people are still seeking answers, right? Answers to what? Because of the diverse uh, ways of our industries, even say for example, one logistic company to another logistic company have way different way of doing things, right? And that creates, that creates unique problems of themselves. So uh, transformation has become, you know, a, a, a personalized for each company, right? It's an effort that cannot be just, oh, you know, all logistics company do like this. All mining companies do like this. Financial services company do like this. Now with the rise of Gen AI, personalization, hyper-personalization has become even more beautiful, even more, available, accessible in, in ways that we can never imagine because of its ability to gather all this big data, understand each of industry's uh, problems and unique sets of potentials, they're able to give us much more than we can even think of. You know, if I was to think all those solutions by myself, there's no way I have enough time to study and learn all of them, right? So. Generative AI has been my partner. As a matter of fact, as I'm talking to you, I'm opening up my Gemini, <laughs> Yahoo to Google, <laughs> right? 
So these are the things that we need to be to be uh, mindful of that uh, the world has changed and companies that hasn't adapted to artificial intelligence will become dinosaur that's what i always say you know so how, but then the problem is how do i transform right uh, what are the steps you know because much of that uh, you know some companies face failures because of transformation because their their employees think because of job displacement they weren't prepared for it they said oh my job is going to be gone um, and they they started to have strikes right so you have to prepare reskilling upskilling your employees getting them ready for what's coming you know these are important and and then later on you know you need to create solutions compile unique sets of way of doing things it can't be just you know uniformity and then you just well everybody can well this company does that why can't we adapt that it doesn't happen like that so this is very important for us especially in this time of age to have a hyper personalization in delivery we cannot anymore auto, auto, automate everything without understanding the unique sets of every business very interesting edmund thank you so much i think you have given us some food for thought as well about the importance of diversity and the challenges so i'm just going to reset the conversation and also a small recap it was very different uh, thought processes here we have indonesia we have india uh, we have people talking about the challenges we have people talking about the fact that there is uh, innovation is important transformation is important dealing with the government dealing with regulation and of course there are business opportunities that's that's some of the things that have come out over here so seema now we will just get back to you and uh, you know your your route there tell us more about the cultural aspects of it right because some sensitive topics keep coming out will this will a generation you know gen ai make me lose my job will it create a problem for me how do i upgrade my skills so you're going to have innovation you need this progress but you also have a lot of uh, you know people worried that how does it affect me in the right way or the wrong way so can you throw some light on this and what are the challenges and global cultural issues that you all are looking at not just at google but i'm sure you're talking to so many people so would love to hear your thoughts on this seema please absolutely um, yeah we do hear those concerns all the time but um, it reminds me of a book that i read a long time ago uh, on how this is not so much about human intelligence versus machine intelligence it is really augmented intelligence that has the answers to everything that we are trying to solve for so it's not artificial intelligence and uh, you know a human pitted against it but we're really working together to solve the problem and uh, one thing that could perhaps help alleviate those fears of job loss is not so much that ai is coming out to get you and replace your jobs it's really making you a lot more efficient at what you do now um, can a human in the loop ever be completely gotten rid of i don't believe so at all um, you know sometime back there was apprehension that some domains like creativity for example are the absolute cornerstones which cannot be touched by ai right and today we have seen that shattered ai can create better creatives than humans ever could um so what remains to be seen is some of those other cornerstones that we hold sacred like judgment like empathy are those really replaceable by machines um there are attempts for sure for example when we build bots even today these gen ai powered bots we try to build empathy into the conversation so it's trainable to some extent but uh, it does not fully replace what a human can do at all um in fact we're tracking all these stats for example in a call center where uh, we're trying to deflect calls to an automated agent instead of a human yes it serves uh, the purpose of saving costs but how often are we happier talking to a person who can understand our problems versus a bot who can give us some automated responses so i think that's where the consumer preferences still remain for having that human touch where it really matters and i think the problem before us truly is not so much to address the replacement but it is to identify those niche niche areas where uh, ai can or cannot play a role and where humans will continue to be an integral part of the solution that's how i see it 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Seema. I'm sure, you know, we'll learn a lot in terms of as we progress, we will actually know what's going to happen in the real time world. And of course, Seema, remember that I, and not just from you, but from everyone else, uh, in terms of the hackathon also, I want you all to later on come back and say, what are the things that you would like to see the participants work on? It could be, you know, some solutions that you feel. Seema, what I was saying was, uh, can you hear me now, Seema? Yes, I just I want can. to uh, sure. Yes. So I just want to thank you for this, and also I tell all the other panelists as well. Remember, we are talking about the hackathon aspects of it. So I want you all to think of at least one two points or one two solutions that you would like the uh, you know the participants to work on. It could be on banking solutions, it could be on manufacturing, it could be on retail commerce. Or it could be in media and entertainment. Okay, so just keep that angle in mind because I'm just resetting the room that we have another 15 minutes before we go into the conversations with the attendees and their questions. Okay, uh, Sanjeev, I will now just uh, come into you. That you are, I, you know, it's all ultimately. I know how close you are to founders. You care a lot for the entrepreneurs, but at the same time, you have a balancing act because you're working with the government, you're working with the industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So keeping those elements in mind. I want you to, uh, for, let's not just get into manufacturing, but in the other way, because I know that you do a lot of work around fintech. You do a lot of work with people on, you know, this uh, machine learning, agriculture. So keeping those contexts in mind and your industry conversations, where do you see, uh, say, a roadmap for the next one year where some really incredible stuff is going to be happening and challenges that are going to be happening? Maybe you would like to talk something about that, SMEs, startups, even you're working with IoT hardware, you're working with pharma because uh, you have the life sciences and healthcare innovation forum. So obviously there's a lot of work on pharma as well. So what do you see happening in these areas, market trends, competitive landscape, if you can share something, sir? Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, you're right. I, I do get a chance to work not, not only with the startup community, but also lot of different sectors that include healthcare, pharma, manufacturing, and others. Uh, so one thing is common uh, that the uh, so AI is sort of becoming horizontal in a way, right? I mean, we pretty much see in every domain and every almost every problem set, I would say. Uh, and uh, uh, the the trend that we are beginning to see, or or where we are actually uh, uh, the the mindset change where, where, where people were resistant to doing things that has already people have crossed that that bridge. Uh, solution demand is started coming. We see solution adopting uh, adoption coming from a uh, uh, not just at the high level of the people who are manufacturing cars, but we also see a small SME who's um, who's in Penia will also want to deploy a solution when it comes to uh, areas which will benefit him. Um, there is another area on healthcare side where India stands to benefit a lot. I think that's the area that where we see a uh, big gap where India has on the demand side or where the population to address and the doctors and the technology, current technology that is there. Uh, the AI has definitely come to bridge that gap in a big way. I talk about that. I mean, there are so many areas I can talk about, but this is the area that gets very close to to my heart in a way, because there I see a real impact of it to the masses. While on the business side, I think a lot of us interact, but when it comes to the to the public life or the people, citizens and who, who stand to gain, uh, and that's where we have seen some real benefits of that. You know, you talk about uh, some of the, uh, for example, let me take a couple of examples, you know, people who go through, lose their livelihood because of the loss of uh, eyesight. The glaucoma is a disease if it uh, can actually take away the livelihoods of the people because if it's not detected early. Now we have devices. I mean, earlier people had to go to the hospital to do eye checkup. Now you can take portable devices to the rural areas, which have on, on the edge. You don't even have to go to the cloud in some cases. On the edge, which is AI is there, which can actually detect some of these disorders much early. Uh, and we see uh, people's... Uh, livelihoods not getting taken away, you know, uh, simply because they're able to save their life side. We have seen people's lives getting saved like a cervical cancer is a, another disease that that afflicts women in India. And we have seen a lot of people losing their life simply because it doesn't get detected early. 
and uh, these portable devices the new age portable devices which have started becoming come I mean, into the mainstream in last one year or year and a half and their price points have now come to a point where you know uh, where there is no barrier to adoption at least from the cost standpoint these are the areas i believe are actually making a difference on the ground uh, and and there are many such things right i mean when it comes to diagnostics making diagnostic easy and quick uh, these are the areas which are actually Uh, making difference at the ground level um now coming to the other side on the pharma side of things you know we have seen things on the high end side where people are using um ai on the drug discovery uh, these are the real use cases where people have actually saying that can we shorten the life cycle uh, and having to go through such a long process and expensive process of drug discovery to using some of these uh, newer age startups Uh, which are using ai to shorten your life cycle and some of the fortune 500 fortune 100 and companies are actually working with the startups in india and that's the job we do try to bring this uh, the the ability to solve the problem by large company as well as in the public life using some of the uh, solutions which are coming from the startup so that's the beauty we are seeing lot of new solutions coming from the new age companies smaller companies and uh, and the willingness of the large companies to adopt that so yes we see all the uh, development uh, and adoption all across um, and i would say interesting times and things are likely to change uh, you know much more these things will become much more impactful in the in the coming months but the process has already started i hope i did not go all over the place but i wanted to give you a general uh, view of of the landscape especially in india did we lose our moderator <laughs> okay am i visible acha i'm back i'm back don't worry i'm here sanjeev <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so thank you so much sanjeev no you didn't go on and on you were absolutely to the point as always and i think you gave us a very good glimpse on what is actually happening in the real world and i think thank you for that sanjeev as always you 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 throw some excellent insights so now i will uh, quickly step it to uh, you know sanjeev Uh, Sanjay, see, you have so much of experience. You have been working with so many companies, and uh, if you have to give some input, that in terms of decision making, risk taking, and all these challenges that are going to come up, and when people have to face up to and learn about AI, what would you say are the key elements that, as a leader, as a founder, and as anyone who's running a large organization, what do you think they should be mindful of? And uh, you know, glad to hear your thoughts, please. uh sanjay i think you just said unmute yourself please huh? just unmute i don't worry don't worry <laughs> sorry i just uh, put it on no mute. worries no, yeah good yeah, to no, go. uh, thanks vichita for that question and i think it's a really pertinent question because uh it's a question that comes up in many organizations uh and i've been facing that for the last couple of years you know when i talk to the ceos the management the board members and organizations and a lot of ai is an r and d you know they've been working on it for a year or two it's still an r&d what they mean able to kind of translate into real life applications is still a much smaller proportion and the question always is and, and and this is particularly kind of nuanced for financial services where the outcomes that you get from your ai models ai applications need a very high level of precision you can't afford to have you know the traditional hallucinations factored in there uh because it has a huge impact on people's financials people's kind of lives businesses uh reputations everything and what i find is while ai use is getting nuanced and a lot of experimentation a lot of you know internal hackathons going on uh you know use cases being experimented with the journey has been a bit slow for large organizations one of the things i you know went into a management meeting and uh, they said so why do you think this has been slow for us and i turned around and said how many of you know how to code and or ever coded before and there were a couple of guys and i said how many of you understand how ai works and uh, i think there was just one hand up in the room and uh, it was the cto and cio uh, you know who had obviously been keeping up with what's happening nobody else I said so picture this you're running a business and you 
believe there's huge opportunity that AI should be able to derive from, you know, or deliver into your business. But the challenge you have is the guys who are trying to develop the solution don't have the same vision for the business that you have. So one of the things I'm going to tell you is enroll yourselves into AI programs where you're learning about statistical modeling, you're learning about Python, you're learning about you know, how those things come together. And I'm not saying you're going to do this because you're going to sit down and write code, but you understand the tools of your game. You will be in a much better position to be able to guide your teams in prioritizing their efforts, picking this up and seeing which are the areas in my business where that capability can lead to transformation. Right now, in many organizations, there's a huge disconnect. Uh, the guys sitting at the top do not sufficiently understand how AI operates, right? So the entire kind of innovation has been left uh, largely at a level where they understand how it works, but in terms of the application to the business and the full picture benefit case is not connected fully. And I think that's some of the things that organizations need to do where literally, uh, you know, much as we're saying, look, it's going to impact jobs and people need to be reskilled. I think a lot of managements need to be reskilled because if this is going to be one of your key tools for business management, uh, business optimization, you know, remodeling your businesses, then you need to understand how that tool works. I hope that kind of uh, yes uh, yes sanjay and i think it's also a very evolving i mean today we are here you know we're here today tomorrow it could be something else and we have to just be alert for all these aspe aspects uh, wilson if i may now come to you you're sure. working in the rural area so very specifically if there's something that you have implemented and if there's some data that you can sign you know share with us if possible like how did operational efficiency go up what was the impact how did it affect the community if in all the work that you've been doing over the last few years, and if you're comfortable sharing it, we would love to understand from you in terms of impact, in terms of actual work that has happened on the ground. Go ahead, Wilson. Sure, sure thing. I'll, I'll just give, um, uh, not sure if you can see uh, myself or, or hear me, um, just to make, just to test in here. Okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. We can hear you, Wilson. We can hear you Perfect. loud and clear. All right. Uh, so, so just um, basically just to give you a, a sense of um, the impact uh, of our customers, um, you know, uh, basically, um, uh, since they have used our platform, um, their income have gone up at least three times uh, within six months, uh, mainly just because they are able to get supplies on time. Um, in, in Indonesia, because of the initial supply chain issues that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to get a consistent supplies. Um, things are usually out of stock. I come from a rural areas myself. Uh, when I was little, when I tried to find something like a mocha ice cream, green tea ice cream, forget it. You will not be able to find those <laughs> in where I'm from. Um, however, if let's say you find, try to find chocolate vanilla, of course, it's always there, right? So, so the, the issues related to specific items whereby brands, um, you know, uh, you have seen all these brands spending millions, probably billions of dollars on advertising and their target market is obviously the largest uh, uh, bank or, or basically the largest uh, number of customers who are actually based in the rural areas of Indonesia, mainly on TV, uh, sometimes on, 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 on basically online digital marketing and so on. However, if the supplies are not there, uh, then you can't sell, you can't get it, um, you just can't buy it. Uh, and, and that's the impact that we have given to them uh, from the income perspective. Uh, 60 percent, 65 percent to be exact, of our customers who are actually store owners are women. Uh, that's actually another big impact right there. Uh, a lot of the people who actually run the store in the village are actually the moms uh, who basically where the husband usually just go uh, into the farms, right? And, and, and basically being a farmer, uh, they are actually taking care of the house, making sure that there is a food in the house and so on. Uh, so those are actually our customers and you know, we have been able to give them uh, more opportunities, not only by selling goods through their little store, uh, uh, what we call in, in our uh, Indonesian language is called warung, um, uh, in, in India I think it's called Kirana. Um, so, so we are not only just giving them um, those uh, opportunities, but they are also able now to sell something that they have not sell before 
uh, through multiple different platforms. Imagine uh, some of our customers now are able to sell certain goods such as basically pots and pans uh, online through live commerce, through WhatsApp, uh, through all these platforms. And that's because we are able to provide that capabilities uh, within our platform itself. Now, the thing is that uh, whether um, you know it's AI or non-AI, what we are, what I or at least we uh, as 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 dagangan, uh, we always look at the application of it. You know, is it actually adding values uh, into the users or not? So far, um, of course, the technology, the artificial intelligence, the Gen, gen AI spe specifically has been able to help us uh, to to perform those uh, specifically. That's actually on the demand side. Now, of course, on the supply side, you know, it's a constant, uh, keep, constant changes uh, that we keep have it happening uh, within our operation, inventory management, route op or optimization. Now, just just to give you uh, an example, um, our cost per order has gone down uh, probably by ninety percent in the last two years since we applied certain different, um, you know. Uh, route optimization, for example, uh, in proper inventory management and also demand forecasting. It definitely helps uh, in terms of the operational itself. However, those are operational. It's something um, that might work in our company. I'm not sure if it can be applicable to most other companies. However, uh, basically, we believe that it's a constant finding in iterative findings um, that we have to just keep you know, trying to understand what's out there and apply it uh, within our platform itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilson. And yes, you're absolutely right. We call our small stores as Kirana stores. Yes, you got that. Absolutely. You hit it the nail on the head. And I think your explanation about how it's very important about uh, diversity, inclusivity, focusing on the women, women entrepreneurs who run these stores. It is the case also in India. We have a lot of women who are involved in this and it's a very important, uh, you know, ways of generating income because they take care of families. So I think what you highlighted is uh, beautiful, Wilson. Thank you so much for that. And I think Seema, this is also food for thought, right? If Gen.AI is only going to s support uh, certain parts of society, what happens to people in, you know, who are in the lower rungs of society? This is something that we should definitely think about. And now let us uh, get to Edmund. Edmund, just to give you a context, we are on 355. We have a couple of questions also that have come in. A little bit tough questions. So I don't know how, how we're going to answer it. But for you, Edmund, if you have to say for a leader who wants to be a transformational leader, what are the qualities? What are the ways that they can really build themselves up to that level? Because today, India, I think, is 70% of our population is in that age group of 25 to 40, 45. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges. I'm sure the same is in, in Indonesia. So specifically leadership qualities and how are they going to develop it? If you can concisely uh, share that with us, that'd be awesome. Thank you. I think nowadays, you know, uh, with AI being a highlight in the world, uh, leaders need to embrace, right? Leaders need to be, uh, I'm sorry if my, Heads are bogging because I'm I'm in the car on my way home, but uh, democratization of AI has become much important for leaders to embrace. What does it mean? You know, we always think that uh, AI can only be done by a handful of smart people. Now, when you uh, embrace AI to your uh, whole organization, where people can create you know, uh, with uh, what we call codeless, right? Or um, what do you call, uh, 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 when we, we don't need to be uh, 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 a genius before we can use AI, you know. Now those are available for our teams to, and to use, you to optimize their own way of doing things, you know, to financing their stuff, uh, to increase efficiencies within each of the departments, I think you will have better bet. And the other thing with generative AI is enabling us as companies. I mentioned earlier, I, I do a lot of consulting with startups, with a lot of companies, uh, various sectors, banking, uh, healthcare even. You know, nowadays, without the help of AI, 
we are able to fine tune what are the the options we have in the business and focusing on business value is has become uh, easier more than ever now with generative ai because you could see a lot of uh, different sets of you know especially when you're creating a business strategy right you know before this happened with uh, what do you call this with uh, generative ai drugs creation are takes much longer than ever right now the rise of ai and generative ai specifically has enabled a lot more companies to come up with simple solutions for uh, many different variations of product even personalization of product because of generative ai you know personalization of product has become something that everyone wants i mean i don't want to be serve same like everybody else uh, earlier we talk about uh, what do you call this well, ethics and it becomes a, an issue whenever uh, things like this enable us to create more uh, ethics of copyright infringement and all these different things and even thinking that AI later on can be like you know uh, remember that movie uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> you know uh, judgment day you know thinking that it will get there where ai can do a lot more than human might be able to replace human and this is this is something that again we need to be uh, mindful of how can we enhance employees instead of thinking instead of them thinking that somebody something going to replace me helping them grow within the business which needs to be doing uh, today you know how can we uh, embrace it and go forward with strategy not just well give me a solution ai is not a ai is not a product ai is is a partner where you can embrace and help you in your business grow and my that's my take on that Fantastic, back to you Edmund. The, yeah, the partnering and being collaborative and uh, personalization, I think that's what you're saying is important. Fantastic. So, the, ladies and gentlemen, it's precise, or it's just precisely four o'clock. The understanding we have is that we have about 10 to 15 minutes more. So, what I've done is that I've, we have collated about four to five uh, questions that are coming out. Some of them will be a little bit sensitive. So, I just give you a gist of what is the conversation that is coming from the participants. Definitely, they are asking about jobs. They're saying, will it disrupt jobs and what are the job opportunities available and how can we upgrade our skills to get there is definitely one of the things they're talking about. The second thing that they're asking over here is that in terms of uh, Gen AI, right? how does it create sustainable global supply chains and make it more effective and will it actually help? You know, One of the things that we always talk about, especially when elections come, is the inflation, the price of commodities, the price of food. So... At the end of the day, can these kind of technologies actually help the common person is one aspect that they're talking about. The second aspect, uh, one more thing that is coming out here is can small scale companies achieve what larger scale companies are doing? And of course, now this is a dichotomy, right? I mean, why would you want to give up your competitive advantage? So again, Siva, you might have to uh, step in here and talk about some of these things. And also they're talking about that, of course, uh, learning is important for students. A lot of startups and smaller companies do take uh, Google credits. They use Google Workspace. They use uh, whatever other aspects uh, JDI can do for them. So they're asking all these kind of questions. Can it help us to reduce our costs? Can it help? How can we take advantage and learn and get good, great jobs? So who, like, how do you, how would you like to, who would like to talk about these things first? Job opportunities and uh, competition, small, large, big. How does one handle it? It's open to it's an open yeah. conversation. Okay, we have ten minutes. So if yeah, anyone I, wants to give an input, go for it. Yes, I, I probably have. I have a lot. Oh, go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> no, thanks, Edmund. I'll take a quick stab at it, and maybe you can add on. So on the learning programs, I do think this is one area that always has been and still continues to be an area that sees a huge, huge dearth of talent. So if you're up for uh, scaling up 
and really upping your game. Uh, there is no dearth of courses that are available. Plenty of free courses. In fact, Google made a commitment to upskill over 2 million people in this field a couple of years ago. And we stick to that commitment. There are a lot of free courses that are available if you'd like to learn up. Um, in terms of job opportunities, I think the one thing that people often get stuck on when they think of Gen AI as a field is, it is an engineering heavy field. Do I have a background in data? Can I understand analytics? But uh, what we often miss out with that lens is that there are a plethora of opportunities for even the non-technical people. In fact, this has been a great leveler because even folks like me who've spent all of my career in data analytics and AI now feel that even folks who do not come with such a deep background can truly easily learn up these things because the whole proposition amongst other things is that there is low code, no code ability to develop uh, applications without uh, the need to code really. So even if you're non-technical, uh, there are roles that are uh, truly up for grabs in terms of what kind of products you can envision with Gen AI, how you can take those to market. So there are plenty of things that you can explore beyond just technically coding in Gen AI. So that's what I'd encourage attendees to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. And Edmund, you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, I've, I've been helping a lot of, uh, you see, AI talents are not many. So I've been uh, trying to uh, recruit as much, you know, from universities, from even from people who've worked elsewhere, but then uh, working. So, for example, in accounting, where, you know, later on, you know, a lot of these, these different, uh, what do you call this, different uh, segments of uh, area of study will not be relevant you know i mean not not that it's not going to be relevant but it's be much required because you know repetitive jobs are going to be replaced by uh, automation so i've been trying to engage with a lot more uh, every year i've had uh, uh, thousands uh, of um, people that i've recruited to 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 get into ai right and one of the things I always tell them that, you know, in these day and age, you know, AI has grown so much that things that we never thought of come up. Can you imagine what is a prompt engineer? <laughs> I mean, these things are nothing in, in our, and those kind of jobs exist now, prompt engineers. How do you design prompts for uh, chat GPT and stuff like this? You know, this, this has, these are some of the new jobs has been created through uh, the development of artificial intelligence. We 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 need a lot more people who be be able to uh, what do you call this uh, test you know user testing do a lot more because uh, again that can be biased right so we need people to be watching out for things that may conclude into their biasness you know so something like this is has become uh, much more sweeter now so. There's a lot easier things with low code, no code mentioned by uh, Seema earlier that people can do generally very easy uh, as long as they're willing to learn. So I think um, opportunities are out there. And uh, again, resources are available everywhere. You just Google it up and I'm pretty sure it's there. Uh, you can you can yes, get it for Google, free. Google has all the answers. That's what you're saying, Edwin. <laughs> Fantastic. So, okay, it's now 4.06, so we have another few minutes. And this is, again, an open question, you know, whether Sanjay, you or Sanjeev or Wilson or even Seema, you can step in. Uh, see, it's yeah. one we talk about learning. We're talking about, remember, we're in a hackathon. There are attendant, attendees here also. So one of the things that I would love to, sort of, to hear from each of you is, what it would be the specific kind of uh, use case of a generative AI uh, solution or a problem solving? And remember, I asked you all about that in the beginning as well, and I want you to think about it. So you all can still think about it and talk about it. There is one small question that is still I would like you guys to share some thoughts and inputs around, right? Um, like it's about speed. You know, like, uh, I mean, you know, things are moving so fast, and uh, sometimes it's very difficult to keep in touch with the way the technology is evolving, right? So what are the ways that you as leaders are keeping in touch with technology and the various things that are happening over here? What are the smart ways to do it? And are there some questions that you have which you're not able to find solutions to? And maybe as panelists, you all can uh, you know, solve each other's uh, thought processes, which is not clear. So giving you this angle. And then I want that one liner on the use case. Open conversation. Anyone I can, can uh, 
So Vijayta, thanks for that. And uh, you know, that's a question uh, that comes up often. How do I keep in touch with what's happening in the AI space? Uh, which is fast evolving, a uh, lot of things being built, a lot of things being broken. If I look at all the social media plays, uh, where I find the most rich exchange and open exchange on AI is actually on Twitter or X. Uh, so the amount of engagement that I see of a lot of thought leaders that we you know, know of, a lot of academia, it's on Twitter, it's not on LinkedIn, it's not on other platforms, you know, Facebook or anything else. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there you can go and follow. There are a lot of, uh, you know, institutions there you can go and follow. And they are very, very actively engaged. So it's not they'll post once a week. They, you know, some of these guys could be posting every other day uh, or, or multiple times a day. But it's really good because it's literally like... Uh, you know, having a panel like this, but at a much larger scale and, and, and some really rich food for thought there. Uh, so I actually encourage people go onto that platform. I've, in my research, I found it to the best so far. Uh, it could all change, but right now it is. Uh, you will also find the institutions to follow. Uh, there are individuals who are publishing their own blogs and papers and some really good insight. Uh, you can, you know, come across some of that content, but you can also subscribe to it. Uh, so that's probably one place I would say you can find a lot of content there uh, and see how it's kind of emerging. On the use case, uh, you know, my background is financial services, so I'll focus on that. One of the challenges financial services has had is a one size fits all approach. So, you know, if you go to borrow money from a bank and this is their car loan interest rate. Now, whether, you know, you're earning, you know, a million dollars a year or you're earning $20,000 a year, uh, once the loan is approved, you're both paying the same interest rate, right? And uh, the way we understand interest rate should work is there's a cost of funds, there's a cost of liquidity, there's a cost of risk, and there's a profit margin. And essentially what's happening is maybe the better credit is subsidizing the lesser credit or it's creating you know, just kind of an excuse to have a one size fits all pricing. So I think today with AI, with generative AI and the capability of higher quality predictive models you can have is an ability that you can bring the individual pricing that is today afforded to only large customers or large corporates down to SMEs, to micro institutions, to individual borrowers. Uh, so that would be a great case to crack. We've been working on it. We've done some progress in that area. Uh, but there's a lot of room to be worked on there. Awesome, Sanjay. I think, yes, what you say makes a lot of sense, especially in a booming and growing economy like India and even Indonesia. That uh, personalization, yes, perfect. Thank you so much, Sanjay. You were brilliantly done. I think you, you listed it very well. Thank you. Uh, who would like to go in next? I'm happy to go next. Uh, Please, Tima, go ahead. We, if I can get greedy and ask for two use cases maybe rather than one so one oh, is a, a set of virtual experiences that uh, and i'm just trying to think of use cases that could inspire applicability across industries right so when i think of virtual experiences uh, the cosmetics accessories apparel companies are an obvious candidate so we've had customers do a lot of work with us on virtual try-ons, for example, with cosmetics, or if there are apparel, can you take a look at what it would look like on me without me having to actually go to the store and try it? So those are some really interesting applications and really fun to work with when you see uh, some of these come to life as images. Um, then there could also be some applications of this um, in terms of physically exploring places. For example, Google's doing a lot of work with museums around the world where you can actually go into a museum, look at the artifacts, hear the guide uh, audiobooks that are available with it and so on. So maybe there is plenty more that we can do and it's really just limited by our imagination. So if the teams could pick virtual experience use cases, I think there is plenty of applicability. The second um, I was greedy for is how do we use public data um, uh, to trigger some meaningful action? When I say this, I really have financial services in mind. That's why I've seen a lot of applicability, but I'm sure it's broader. So, for example, um, RBI keeps foxing us with these regulatory changes that are getting dropped every few weeks, right? And that is a big 
big challenge for fintechs and banks. Um, is there a way that we can track some of these regulatory changes in a meaningful way, translate that to what change does the demand of me as a company? How do I really maybe make my systems more robust to comply with those changes? That's one. Or again, in the financial services space, if I've lent to small farmers, for example, agri loans, I don't have any Sybil score for them, but there is maybe data that I can gather which can help me trigger actions for where my loans could go bad. Uh, I mean, farmers could be micro enterprises as well. But yeah, uh, I think those could be some really good use cases to pursue with publicly available data. And how do you really bring that in to trigger some meaningful action? Amazing, Seema. I think you, you showed your intent and thinking. I think the use cases that you've asked for are beautiful. I'm not sure if you have been in touch with Sanjeev, because Sanjeev, few months back, if you remember, you had done that uh, AI conference where there were a lot of uh, startups and companies were showcasing AI. Maybe later on, you and Seema should talk and see what can be done, right? If you remember AI, we are both solutions now. So it was really interesting stuff. Yes, yes. Right, sorry, right. <laughs> anyway, please, let's no, get back to... Uh, sorry, Sanjeev. Please go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, there is... There is, there is so much to do actually on every front at this point of time, I would say. Uh, the, the field is quite open and uh, the, some of the areas that where I see, uh, which, which is what I just said earlier also, I think there's so many public data sets that are uh, yet to be made available to people, you know, when it comes to the healthcare and the areas which can actually make an impact. Uh, some of those if, uh, public data sets can be made available in a, in a way which, uh, which uh, follow the regulation or, or within the government guidelines. I think that will do wonders for us uh, when it comes to uh, generating some of the good outcomes from that, I think. Uh, so that that's one area. And one of the other areas which come, which I have heard from a lot of financial institution is fraud detection. You know, uh, they say, how can we do it the, when we are talking and because a lot of people onboard people on the phone uh, through the conversations, if if there can be some way to find, uh, detect the fraud there or detect some patterns, you know, uh, that's what a lot of financial companies are looking at. I think that's, that's one something that afflicts uh, uh, people who are in this business. Uh, so these are the two areas which, which are on top of my mind, but there are, Sheng, uh, there are many, many more areas, I think, which can actually use uh, the technology as well as the data. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. On a small aside, one of the things that people have been talking about is how candidates are using uh, you know, artificial intelligence to crack interviews without really having the real knowledge. So that's also a situation, but that's a different one. That's, 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 that's a conversation uh, for the if it comforts you, I've met a couple of companies that have created technology to be able to detect that. Okay. Um, yeah, so. but, but I find <laughs> students always outsmart that technology. I talked to some students <laughs> and they said, you can use whatever technology you want. We have a, we have a workaround for that. Uh, so <laughs> that is the answer I got from some of the seniors in the college. <laughs> oh God. Amazing. The students are getting sm uh, smarter than the teachers. Huh? <laughs> oh, they always are. They always are. Good, good. Fantastic. But thank you, Sanjeev, Seema and uh, Sanjay. Uh, now, if, we, if I may request Wilson and Edmund to think of a use case each, please go ahead. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, so, you know, I've been uh, working with uh, basically uh, the, the rural areas uh, for the last four years. I think what I find um, quite interesting is that localization matters a lot. Uh, what happened is that the data sets that, that we are actually training our Gen AI today uh, are mostly based on whatever that is available. Um, however, there are certain information uh, that are very localized. You know, for example, uh, within uh, you know, one village in Indonesia, for example, I'm talking about, let's say, in Java Island, uh, that village probably um, overall probably about like 20 uh, kilometers square in total. But once you go into the next village, uh, the behavior completely changed just because the way uh, the, the income that is coming in from it to the, each of the villages are different. 
um, you know, uh, so in terms of when they have the money, uh, just because they are uh, selling corn today, while the other guys, the other villagers are actually uh, uh, selling uh, rice, for example, uh, the time does matter. And as, as a result of that, the things that they're actually purchasing matters, the behavior that they are purchasing matters, uh, the amount of money that they have uh, at certain amount of time matters, uh, all the way into how do we actually get goods in? Because even though they're the village is next to each other, uh, the accessibility uh, of going into that village differs as well. Um, so a uh, combination of this uh, accessibility as well as the behavior are sometimes not necessarily available um, when we are talking about uh, supply chain uh, solutions. Now, we are still talking about local. Now, what if let's say we try to get goods, let's say from India, if we want to uh, import it into Indonesia or from Indonesia, we want to export it to uh, India. There's a lot of opportunities for a lot of small businesses uh, that can potentially trade. However, because of the lack of knowledge right now in terms of that localization, um, this is not really as feasible and, and, and not possible as well. You know, uh, we we'll hope that uh, this type of use case uh is pro potentially upcoming uh is is already pro probably is already there uh hopefully however we are uh hoping that uh once it's there uh, it can make things a lot easier for trades uh for you know uh getting uh the uh the people the the people in the village especially to to be able to earn more uh, to be able to uh, get through their life a lot easier as well Thank you so much, Wilson. This definitely resonates, making life easier, better supply chain, and the fact that you're focusing on the very important rural economy as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Edmund, it is now your opportunity. You're going to be closing. So give us something really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in logistics and mining, you know, I've always been, uh, uh, recent past few years, I've been doing a lot of uh, AI solutions and being able to personalized to the characteristics of the industry and we you probably heard about fatigue monitoring you know we are able to detect facial recognition uh, whether that person is sleepy whether that person is you know because of their uh, micro expressions within their uh, the surface of their faces we're able to know that oh this guy is blushing meaning he's tired right uh, or uh, the, the the you know the uh, the the pupils are started to dilate which indicates that this person is getting sleepy and or is drunk, uh, basically. There's quite a lot of uh, use cases that we've been looking into and uh, we've, already, uh, we've already implement uh, a lot of these into our gender model creation where we're able to see and forecast whether or not certain length of uh, distance where they bring these, you know, in Indonesia especially, people drive trucks more than 12 hours a day, you know, uh, because, you know, they want to meet deadline. They want to be able to get things uh, uh, on time. And this creates a lot of hazards uh, in Indonesian, uh, you know, islands and, and, and whatnot. So the training data that we, 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 we see potentially, we're able to create informations for us to detect you know, to give us early warnings even before it happens. Looking at their, uh, look at their scheduled route. Looking into their, uh, how many hours that they've been on the, you know, on the seat driving. Looking into their facial fatigue monitoring. You know, using cameras and everything. We're able to synthesize uh, AI powered fleet management, and this is again hyper personalized. Not everyone can. Uh, work long hours. Not everyone can uh, be up all the time. So we're able to understand and learn uh, individually. You know, this person needs to take a break every hour. This person needs to take a break every 30 minutes. You know, oh, this person, he sleeps for five minutes and then later on he's, he's up and then he's, he could run again, you know. So understanding and personalizing uh, solutions has always been the the uh, I think the the gist of generative AI because it's able and it's capable of understanding uh, behavior. So this has been uh, something that um, 
automatically that has been done by AI. And also we've created mine designs, you know, understanding how mining works in certain areas differently from different areas. You know, AI able to detect those, uh, the structures of the land and all these different things that happens there. How long does it take before? So again, use cases of AI in the mining industries, in the logistics space has increased by so much. And financial services, I've uh, consulted recently uh, with finance. Uh, again, uh, I think uh, FinBot AI has done a lot of tremendous things, right? And the financial services industry has learned new ways of optimizing, right? Uh, Wilson earlier talked about how can we optimize prices, right? So at the end of the day, we need to know that uh, every business is different and knowing that your business is different is an advantage, right? It's an advantage where nobody else can cope if you specialize on that one thing that nobody else can uh, do what you are doing. So I think for leaders out there, understand your business very well, know which area you want to tackle, which area, what problem you want to solve, and then focus on that using generative AI as a help, as a partner, be able to, uh, you know, focus on the strategies that go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back Asbin. You. you have been emphasizing on that. Yeah, thank you. You have been emphasizing on the use it as a partner, use it as an ally. So, uh, Shweta, over to you. I think we have got some in excellent insights and we've got some fantastic use cases. And a special thank you for to you, Seema. You, have been, you, you wrote a very neat uh, note about sustainability and about green supply chain. So that is also going to be very useful. I mean, each one of you has brought very incredible insights and perspectives. We have learned a lot. And also wishing the attendees all the very best. Please do well. Do I mean, be winners and uh, take support from all the mentors and this experience as well. Over to you, Shweta, and thank you so much, Sanjeev, Wilson, Seema, Sanjay, Edmund. All the very best with everything. Thank you. I've enjoyed this as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shweta. for smoothly moderating the whole session. And yes, definitely a huge thanks to our esteemed panel here uh, for their time and sharing the insights on uh, uh, how Gen AI is changing today's landscape. I'm sure our participants have had a lot to learn. And uh, for our participants here, after attending today's session, if you want to tweak your idea based on what uh, you have learned today, all the ideas and all the amazing examples and everything that has been shared, I want to highlight that we still have four days left. So I would suggest you to go back to your idea and go back to today's discussion and give a thought to what our panelists have shared today and make sure you submit your idea before 17th of March. So um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. No Get in touch. That's the key. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, Edmund. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. See you. Thank you. See you, everyone.